Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Julie Passarelli, the Exhibits and Collections Curator here at Cabrillo Marin Aquarium. Thank you for coming. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. John Dorsey. Dr. Dorsey is a professor at Loyola Marymount University in the Department of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science, where he teaches courses in environmental, biological, and marine sciences. He received his PhD in zoology from the University of Melbourne, his master's in biology and bachelor's in marine biology, both from California State University, Long Beach. Dr. Dorsey is a board certified environmental scientist through the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. He is a past president of the Southern California Academy of Sciences, where he is still very active with their research training program for high school students. He conducts research on the dynamics of fecal indicator bacteria in coastal waters and wetlands and is now working with his students and the Bay Foundation to characterize beaches in Santa Monica Bay. His passion for good water quality is natural. He is an avid surfer. Most days he can be found surfing at El Porto near LMU's campus. The title of tonight's talk is Teaming with Nature in Managing Ermine Runoff, More Bang for the Buck. Please help me welcome Dr. John Dorsey. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I want to thank uh, Julianne and I want to thank Ed for inviting me here. It's a real privilege to be able to come and talk to you a little bit about the research I've been doing. And more importantly, how important it is that I think it is for everyone to embrace the concept of low impact development. Now, what low impact development is, it's a way to deal with our contaminated runoff. As we get deeper into climate change, we are going to see more and more intensive rains. The weather's going to get more extreme. We're going to have more intensive rainstorms, and we're going to have longer drought periods. So what that means is when we really need the water, namely in the summer months, we may not have it. Okay, We need to start bringing in more water from abroad like we do now, and also we need to rely very heavily on our Sierra snowpack, but that may be diminished. In fact, it, all the models show that it will be diminished. So when we really need the water, it may not be there. So that means we've got to get more of our own water resources local. That means we need to bolster our groundwater. Also, when it rains more intensively, that's more contaminated runoff that are hitting our beaches, which is one of our biggest economic benefits of living in Southern California. So, one way to deal with this is to start implementing out throughout our watersheds are these things called low impact development. It's a type of green infrastructure. And it's these kinds of projects are all designed to capture stormwater, get it back into the ground where the pollutants will be decontaminated by natural processes, mainly bacteria breaking down organics, metals getting sequestered into soil particles, filtered out. And also when that water then penetrates deep into the groundwater, now we're bolstering our groundwater reserves. And all this is done through the courtesy of nature. So what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is I'm going to show you a series of slides that will begin talking and showing you some of these different kinds of LID, low impact development types of projects, the strategies, from things ranging from simple lawns. Better to have a simple lawn in than a hard concrete surface or asphalt surface. Let the water soak in. Going to rain gardens, people are starting to remove lawns and replacing lawns with rain gardens. These are our shrubs and trees, grasses that are native. And that starts bolstering uh, things like biodiversity. You're going to get more insects that are native, birds, that sort of thing. Ranging from, then uh, we'll go into the kinds of rain gardens that are actually a little more engineered, where you actually dig out these trenches and replace the, you know, the soils that you took out and replace with soils that will really allow that water to quickly filter through and get into the native soils deeper down into the ground. Those are a little more costly, but they can really capture virtually all the water coming off of a residential property. Then we can go to the larger municipal systems. The Bayana Creek rain garden system. It's a thousand foot long system in Culver City 
that was designed to receive runoff coming off of about 11 acres of industrial uh, parking lots, commercial buildings, industrial buildings, all those sorts of uh, kinds of things that are going on. Pretty, pretty contaminated polluted water comes off of these sites during rainstorms. These big rain gardens will intercept that polluted water, soak it in. If the storm is big enough, it'll fill up and it'll then cascade into two outlets and go into Bionic Creek. So our general approach is, first we have to measure the flows going in. I'll show you how we do that in a second. And then we measure the pollutants during the storm. So the idea was we would go out periodically during the storm. Ideally, we'd want to kind of go out when the storm was ramping up, hit the top of the storm, and then the backside of the storm. So we'd go out, we had sample a variety of pollutants. Meanwhile, the flows are being measured continuously during all these storms. I did discover one thing pretty quick in this, well, two things. One, when we started this uh, project, it was 2016. We had hardly any storms. In fact, we were, we really got into a dry season. I felt personally responsible for somehow triggering our drought. I did feel bad about that. The second thing I found out is that storms only happen in the wee hours of the morning. There's got to be some phenomena tied into that. And actually, there's a third thing. I'm getting too old to be out there at 2 in the morning sampling. And then for, and you can break this up, we actually we broke it into one minute segments. And so we're able to get these flows continuously, so we know every minute we know how much water is flowing from the wall for all these inlets and when they're going to the outlets. And then for each of these segments, we know the concentrations of these various pollutants. So you just cut up the concentration time flow will give you a mass loading. And with that, we add them all up. And we can take the total inlet, total gluten loading minus the outlet, and then the difference is how much stuff stays in the rain garden, which is great. This is every, all, every single outlet and all the inlets had to have custom boxes made to measure the flows. That's how they were. The engineers excel at this sort of thing. These are V-notch weirs. We've got these little PV uh, perforated PC PVC pipes that we drop these hobo data loggers in. And what they're doing is they're, they're measuring actual water pressure that then gets converted to water height. And then using a series of engineering equations, you could actually go to flow. So we will get flows at every single one of these. So this is the one in the uh, weir number three, high and dry, and this is during a storm where the water's cascading in there and down. This is every, all, every single outlet and all the inlets had to have custom boxes made to measure the flows. That's how they were. The engineers excel at this sort of thing. These are V-notch weirs. We've got these little PV, uh, perforated PC, PVC pipes that we drop these hobo data loggers in. And what they're doing is they're, they're measuring actual water pressure that then gets converted to water height. And then using a series of engineering equations, you could actually go to flow. So we will get flows at every single one of these. So this is the one in the uh, weir number three, high and dry, and this is during a storm where the water's cascading in there and down. Sampling, great fun, students liked it. Here we all are, downpour. When it rained the other night, remember how hard it rained the other night? I mean, I actually woke up and thought, oh crap, what time is it? Oops, sorry. <laughs> And it was like, oh, I don't have to go out. This is awesome. I'm, st I'm still getting now, looking up. Well, is it raining yet? I got to check the radar, what's happening, and all that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> shorts, that's students, what can I say? Okay. <laughs> so there, here they are sampling at one of the uh, outlets going in there. Um, sometimes I needed a few extra hands, so I recruited my daughter. She's still smiling at me. That's awesome. So. <laughs> So this is what some of these things look like. And now here's, here's a hydrograph of where the blue line is the total flow at the inlets for this particular, this is one of our biggest storms we had in 2016. The orange line is the outlet, okay? 
So inflow, outflow. And what that is, this shows that for this particular storm, I think it was right up in here, okay? This is the gallons of water infiltrated. We got into the, uh, into the uh, ground there. And this is the size of the rainstorm in inches of rain. And you can see that particular storm, a million gallons of water were infiltrated by that rain garden. That's pretty good. I like that. Of course, when I was showing these data to other scientists, they're going, where's all that water going? <laughs> Do we have some gigantic void now under Bayana Creek concrete? What's going on here? So that raises a whole different question. All I know is it went down into the ground, and I'm happy about that. So this shows you on this particular slide, this is the percent of flow that was infiltrated and the size of the storm. For the smaller storms, everything goes into the ground. None went out into Bayana Creek, hence Santa Monica Bay. And then even that really large storm that I just showed you, over about 75% of the flow was infiltrated. So I'd say that rain garden's doing a pretty darn good job. As far as all the pollutants go, you can see here, uh, fecal bacteria, suspended solids, in the 80, you know, above 85% are retained in the garden. The different metals, copper, zinc, and lead, and these are metals of concern in Bayana Creek. They're on some uh, special regulatory uh, list called the total maximum daily load. You don't want to get into the whole EPA acronym list, which is huge, it's like a phone book. But we're worried about these metals in Bayana Creek. There's too many of them, you know, there's, there's too much of a concentration of these in the creek. And you can see here, above 90, you know, in the 90 percentile retained in the garden, which is really excellent. And then hydrocarbons, combustion and fuel hydrocarbons of different types, again, in the 90s. So it's really good retention of pollutants in this system. And then we got the Playa Vista. We just started really looking at the Playa Vista freshwater marsh. Uh, I've had a couple students working on some nutrient type of analyses. So again, this marsh system is right uh, along uh, Lincoln Boulevard and Jefferson, and it's receiving runoff coming off of the big Playa Vista development. That all actually goes into what they call the riparian corridor that sits on the south edge, right underneath LMU. That water works its way down into underneath the Lincoln Boulevard, and it enters right down here at the south inlet. These two inlets are getting stormwater or just regular dry weather runoff plus stormwater flows from the kind of the Jefferson catchment area. It works its way all the way up to where Home Depot is in those places. Okay, so that place, first of all, biodiversity is amazing there. Any birders out here? Yeah, well, you guys, have you been there? They got like over 250 species recorded. I, I think you guys are really hot on lists, right? Yeah, absolutely, okay. <laughs> well, this is the place to go. They've got some wonderful, wonderful birds there that they've been finding. So we've been sampling, we've been sampling this, and you can see the night uh, levels of nutrients coming in. Well, pretty high coming into the system, especially from the, in these inlets here. This is where they leave that system. Let me go back for a second. What happens is the water works its way slowly through here, all these little islands of uh, different kinds of vegetation, mainly rushes and reeds. Eventually it works its way all the way to the outlet here and it goes underneath uh, the underground into Bayana Creek. And it's a one-way trip because they obviously do not want marine water coming back into that. So it goes through an outfall underneath the uh, Cobra Boulevards and Jefferson Boulevards. So you can see right where it exits the system, the nutrient levels are a lot less. The plants are taking up all those nutrients and other studies by some consultants uh, who are working for uh, Playa Vista have shown that also the bacteria reduced and along with metals and things. A little trip to China. I was really fortunate enough to be able to uh, take a couple trips to China and then finally I actually taught a class, a travel class over there for about mm, a month one June, a couple Junes ago. And it was through the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies. 
It's a Jesuit outfit that's in Beijing. It, uh, they are at the uh, big economic university there in Beijing. And so while we were there, it was great. You know, we took the, it was like half the time you spend in Beijing, we were able to tour around there while we're having our classes, and the other half the time we're on the road into southwestern China to look at these different environmental systems that we're interested in. We got, obviously, you, know, you gotta go to the Great Wall if you're ever in China, and so I take great pride in the fact that I beat my students to the top of that wall going up these stairs, okay? And they go, hey, how come this old guy's ahead of us here? It's, you gotta put the students in their place, you know? And so <laughs> this is how you do it. Uh, temples everywhere. This is not a temple. This is actually the entrance to a big footbridge going over a main channel of a major place where they actually dam the rivers and split it in two. Chinese are great at engineering, believe me. We got to this place here, Zhajiajing National Park. If anybody's ever seen Avatar, this is where they filmed it. And to these high spires. And so this photograph is kind of walking along of this plateau, looking out across here. And then this uh, slide is, we walked the base of all those spires for a couple miles or five miles one day, going all the way down there. Driving rain, but it was still beautiful there. Other sites, um, another, uh, we went to one particular mountain where there's a whole series of temples going all the way up to the mountain. But on the way to the mountain, which I thought was even more interesting is, going along this ancient wall, all completely overgrown with kind of mosses and things. Here's a big snake. They crawled across the road and went, kind of hung right up in a big crack in the wall. And it was awesome. I think it was a boa constrictor of some sort. I'm not sure. But everybody was all freaked out, but I was trying to get good close-up pictures of my iPhone there. Saw things like, uh, over here is the ancient observatory with my students in Beijing, and that was actually um, astronomical uh, tools to measure what's going on with the planets and the stars and things designed and constructed by the Jesuits. They were the first group of uh, Catholics, not missionaries, they weren't there to convert people, they just wanted to like kind of start working on an educational basis with the emperor at the time. And he let them in there, let them stay there, and they actually designed, this is just a couple of the incredible uh, tools that they made for there. This thing right here that looks like hot dogs or some sort of a roasted thing. This is my student's first time at sampling some Chinese cuisine. Those are roasted silkworm larvae. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can see Anna's got this kind of questionable look on her face like, what are we doing to this? And what I kind of like about this experience is at the end of our trip, I had a fellow come in and talk to our class. We were talking about sustainable systems and everything. He goes, well, they got a really interesting use of what we call gutter oil here. Now, mind you, between the time the students landed in Beijing to the time this guy talked to them, they just about finished with our, our stay there. They, when they were on the road, they were eating at all kinds of tiny little mom and pop shops. They might have three tables out on the sidewalk and someone's back there with a walk and they're doing this and doing that and everything and they bring your food. Really delicious food. So the students are sitting there, this guy's talking about gutter oil. And I go, what's gutter oil? And he goes, well, yeah, well, every night what they do is when everybody's just in bed about 2 o'clock in the morning, they pop the manhole covers off the sewer system, and they go down there with buckets, and they, and they literally bucket up all the greases and oils that are floating there. Then they take those out of the sewer system, sewer system, okay? They boil that stuff until they really boil it up and everything. They skim off all the real solid floatables and feed those to pigs and stuff. And then what's left is they filter it and they got oil left. And this is what they use in all the dolls along with those little tiny places where the students are eating this and they're eating that and they're walking this. And, and meanwhile, I'm, I'm going, oh, this is awesome, you know? Because <laughs> I'm watching the class and you can just see their faces going, oh my God. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> I diverge. We went and visited uh, a little wetland area. It's a little village on the side of this river where there's total sustainable living. They actually have created a little wetland and all their, um, they, they compost everything that goes onto their fields for their crops. They have uh, 
they're not cesspools per se, but they are able to take a lot of their waste and turn it into biogas, methane, that they're capturing to use for their cooking. And we had a wonderful vegan meal from the Buddhist uh, family here. And to clean our dishes, they don't use water because water's, you know, they want to, it's, it's precious there. So we use rice husks, and that cleans all the dishes. It takes all the grease right off. And they might give it a real quick rinse, but for the most part, you're using rice husks to clean off the dishes. So all the students are busy husking away their uh, dishes and everything. And in Shanghai, I was wandering through the botanical gardens in Shanghai, and lo and behold, I don't know if you can't read this, but here's this, a couple of exhibits along there. They're like little demonstration uh, gardens. And I started reading this, and it says, clarity of water and magnificence of wood, master of style and something of something. I can't quite read that slide. Well, you read through all the fine print down here. It's a rain garden. It's just the exact thing that I go, you know, and I was on my own. I didn't have my students with me, so I took a bunch of pictures and showed them. But they actually are looking at rain gardens and things here. So it has its downside. It was very smoggy. We experienced some really bad smoggy days. And also, we had a rain, we, it was uh, being in June, we had some thunder showers come through the area, and right behind the university, there are some canals there. And it's part of a small river system, but it's all canaled up, kind of like our channelized uh, rivers in LA here. So after this rain, I had the students go and measure nutrients around. And this rain, this water was totally turbid, and the fish, they were able to get down some steps. These are fish gasping for oxygen. That's how polluted that water was. I'd never seen anything that polluted. And I've been, you know, I hear people complaining about buying a creek and everything. I go, you guys don't know pollution until you go in here and see this. This is pollution. And there was, must have been some other chemicals in that water because the little test kits we were using wouldn't even measure the nitrates because it's something interfered with them. And I wasn't able to bring over stuff in there because of different uh, regulations. But they've got their share of problems, big, big problems, water quality problems in China, air and water quality. So we went from Beijing by train down to Chengdu. And then from Chengdu, we went to other areas. But in Chengdu, very interesting, this is the Tibetan uh, plateau right in here. And this is where all the big forested areas are where they have the panda populations. And so we're able to go in and see pandas and things like that in their not in the reserves themselves, but they have breeding areas where they're trying to breed them up and then try to put the, the ones that have been bred, put them back into the wild. While we were in Chengdu, we visited what's called the Living Water Garden. And this was actually designed by Betsy Damon, who lives up in Oregon in con concert with some Chinese engineers. So it's actually an American plan that would have probably taken us maybe two decades to get the permits to do this. The Chinese go, no problem, we'll do it. Okay, and they do it. <laughs> so they have their ways, okay. So what this is, they've taken, this is like a photograph that was on one of the paths there. This is the Jin River right here, and here's the bridge. And all this is what they turned into all of this. And so the idea here, this is actually, they're very artistic. They designed this in the shape of a fish, okay? And it kind of reminds me of looking at a midshipman sideways, okay, or some other type of a fish like that. Here's the eye right here. And this, when they do, is they're pumping water using solar panels to get their energy. They pump water from the polluted Jin River right up into this well. And then the water then is gravity flown uh, gravity flows all the way through this system, right in through here, all the way to the tail of the fish and back out into the river. We did measure nitrates in there, and we got some pretty good readings in the water coming in, and zero readings, we couldn't measure it with our kits at the tail end. So it does a pretty good job. So right here is the Gen River. It's received awards for being cleaned up. Uh, by the Chinese EPA, or I think they're equivalent of our EPA, we would probably class that river as highly polluted. So that kind of gives you an idea of their baseline, where they're starting from. So this is the, that eye part, and you go right around, they got these weirs. 
so that this is like a little settling pond. It's like a settling pond. You go to Hyperion, you look at the big clarifiers, you can see where they put in the treated uh, effluent that's gone through the secondaries and all the solids are quickly settling down and the really cleaner secondary effluent is going out through these weirs at the very top of those tanks. Exact same system here. And then the water from here starts cascading down and it works its way through these gardens, uh, different kinds of water plants all through here. Here's like a small lake Go running through here. You got a lot of floating duckweed or something similar to duckweed. And they've got these community areas, another beautiful area here. They've, here I am with my three new best friends right here. These ladies were all singing stuff with uh, karaoke type things. It was great. And one thing I like about in, in China, I could kind of see above everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> it really works out well on the subways, okay? So they have big open spaces where the community's doing things. And there was, they're, in the mornings, they're out there, they're doing Tai Chi. They're doing line dancing, believe it or not, which is interesting. A lot of different, very, very much community spirit going on. So my, some of my students were sampling. Uh, when the water was flowing down, now like, we would probably just put a channel going straight down, okay? Not so with these, uh, they made it very artistic. These are like in the shape of flower petals where the water's cascading all the way down and it's adding oxygen in the process as it go, works its way down through the first big banks of vegetation there. Beautiful sight. Meanwhile, back here at home, what's going on now? We have embraced LID. I believe the city of Los Angeles has written it into the building regulations for a lot of new construction. It's, I think it's new commercial uh, construction. I don't believe it's for homes, but for new commercial uh, construction. And a early, well, actually some time ago now, it's about 2005, they had a proposition that was overwhelmingly voted in by the, uh, the public, Proposition O. And what that did was it put about $500 million for these kinds of projects, low impact development projects. So um, the Bay Foundation was part of looking at reviewing projects and um, approving them or recommending that they be approved and funded, all that sort of thing. And just a couple, some of them here, the Southland Wetland Park, okay? That was a big vacant, I think it was a, um, a big vacant or uh, abandoned bus park of some sort, okay? They've turned it into a beautiful wetland park here for the uh, neighborhood. Echo Park Rehabilitation, these are all lotus flowers. And so they're able actually to take the original lotus flowers and kind of put them aside redo the whole place, clean it out. They've got a wetland component to the Echo Park now, and the lotuses are back in there. Grand Boulevard tree wells. Okay, so they put all these wells in, so when it rains, instead of just going straight out into the street and into the storm drain system, it's going down these tree wells. What I really like is Imperial Highway Sunken Median in El Segundo, where I live, okay? So that uh, even though I don't pay city dollars, I'm glad to get to reap the benefits from this project here. This is kind of cool. The, all these white flowers are the Matilda polys, Matilda polys, which are really pretty when they're blooming. One Water LA. Anybody heard about this out there? Yeah, huge, huge project. You know, city, big city bureaucracies are famous for departments not talking to one another, okay? The left hand has no idea what the right hand's doing. Not so with One City, uh, One Water LA. You now have the Bureau of Engineering teaming with the Bureau of Sanitation and other, a lot of stakeholders to start really effectively trying to manage our water. And a lot of projects are going in are doing just that, recapturing runoff. The idea is like in some, I've heard of some plans now to get this runoff and I mean, I'm talking millions of gallons of runoff now from big rainstorms to get it back into the ground and start recharging our um, groundwater reserves because we have to do that as we get deeper into climate change. So it's a very, if you go into One Water LA, just do a search, uh, do one of your search engines, your favorite one, go online and look at that and you will see all the different stakeholders involved and how you can personally get involved in this and attend the meetings and be part of the planning process. So they're starting to get ready to put in a lot of these projects and deal with it. 
A lot of work on the LA River stems from One Water LA. And then finally, back in November, we passed Measure W. And this is going to be, again, it's sort of a countywide measure. It's a parcel tax, but it got voted in. The people realize that we need to have clean water and we need to deal more effectively with runoff. And all these projects are geared toward exactly that. And you can see the um, colors deal with different jurisdictions, okay, who's in charge of the project. But you can see we got projects all over LA County uh, ready to go for the funding that's coming off of this uh, parcel tax. All these projects are designed to try to get what runoff back into the ground where it belongs. Concluding remarks, LID, low impact stuff, works. It's very effective. And the more you could put throughout the watershed, the better off it will be. I heard a term called urban acupuncture. So you could think of LID projects as urban acupuncture, where you're poking holes all over the place to get that water in. The more you could get concentrated in areas, the less runoff you're going to have going into the ocean, and we will make a much healthier environment, and we'll help our groundwater, which we really need to have done. Uh, we just talked about how LA and other local cities are embracing the strategies. Culver City's got some huge plans underway for their whole median going down along Culver Boulevard. City of Santa Monica has always been incredibly progressive when it comes to working with these sorts of things, and especially LID type projects. So there's a lot going on around town that you could personally get involved in too. And finally, implementing these things watershed wide, it's gonna make our uh, urban area a lot more resilient to climate change. We've gotta become less dependent on importing water, so bolstering our groundwater supplies are gonna do that. We know we're gonna get more intensive storms. They're gonna produce some nasty runoff. So it'd be nice if we can get some of the trash off the streets, that'd be good. But if we can get this stuff going into the groundwater, we're not gonna impact our beaches as much, which are a huge part of our economy is our beaches. So with that, I just wanna say a few shout outs there, okay? My students. I cannot do this work without our students, okay? And they're, they're brilliant, we love them to death, and they are always willing to drop everything and go help out whenever they can, and they enjoy it. And they're just an amazing source of um, companionship and good cheer, and they want to learn, and they love doing this kind of stuff, no matter how crappy the conditions are, <laughs> okay? And also the members of the Bay Foundation. I've worked with them for decades now. And it's a great group. And so again, if you want to get involved with things, give the Bay Foundation a call and they can actually get you out there volunteering to help work on projects. A big one is uh, restoration of the Los Angeles dunes. And that's just a really neat project. And they've also got a dune project going on the foreshore of the beach to start raising dunes using natural plants, beach vegetation, about a mile north of Santa Monica Pier. Go on their website and read all about it. You won't go wrong there. And with that, I'll turn it over to you guys for whatever questions you might have. I want to thank you very much for an incredible presentation. We have a small gift for you. Uh, another shopping bag. There you go. <laughs> Notice, not plastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trader Joe's. There I got you mine go. too. And wait, you can put it on. Got to protect that. Oh, head. I like that. Cool. Yeah, protect the, sc the skin on your head. Uh oh. Oh well. We hang on here. Okay. We got it. So we have some time for a few questions, and bear with me. We have a few um, I used to I used to work in Playa del Rey, and I used to drive by the wetlands every day, and as big as they are, to me it was always sad that there's no not more of it. Um, is there any restoration projects of that scale that are contemplated by the California on the coast? You mean uh, as the size of the Biona wetlands? Yeah, Biona, yeah, Biona wetlands. Because I, I used to go through there every day. Yeah, they're, um, they've done some big lagoon restoration projects down at Batiquitos, okay, and, and a couple of them down in San Diego County. But no, there's not very 
we've managed to develop all of our wetlands. I think over 90% of our wetlands are developed. And you have to go way up north into central and northern California to really start to see oh, the yeah. big wetlands. Right we're not really set up to have huge wetlands anyway, the way our coast is shaped, because we're mountainous. Okay, so that's one thing. So that's why what we have, we really need to preserve and bring back. There's some small ones that we're looking at at the mouth of um, Topanga Canyon. They're like postage stamp size wetlands, but they're wetlands nonetheless. They're seasonal, they can close off. Malibu Lagoon's a beautiful place. They just did a big restoration project there on the west side of the Malibu Lagoon to open up the uh, channels there. So now you got some good flow going through there, mainly wind driven the way it was oriented so that we could get uh, more circulation in there and no oxygen problems. Before they restored it, we're having terrible oxygen, anoxic uh, at the bottom there. Now we got good oxygen flowing in and the biodiversity is really in, being enhanced. We got a good population of tidewater gobies going on in there now. So projects like that, okay. But wetlands is probably, or the Bino wetlands is the last really big wetlands. Yeah, I've always been very grateful to the, the Navy for their, uh, the weapons station down at Seal Beach. <laughs> if that station wasn't there, I think those wetlands would be paved over with condos and God knows what there. Yes, sir. Uh, John, do you th uh, the fecal bacteria that's washing into the bay, do you think most of that is human or is that cats and dogs? You would have to really start going after, I don't know, you'd have to really start going after um, real uh, targets within that, looking for human specific type of targets to really understand that, okay? But yeah, you got a lot of like regular animals or wild animals, you've got cats and dogs of course, and then you do have a certain amount of human getting in there, and the human is because we do have homeless populations, has anybody ever tried to use a restroom in downtown LA? <laughs> yeah, how about that? <laughs> That's really a nightmare, unless you just want to go in and pay for a drink and go to use a restaurant. We have no rest. That's what I liked about Beijing. Every, about every three or four blocks, there's a public restroom, okay? And it's actually quite a clean city. And so, unlike LA, uh, we've got homeless populations, and what are they going to do? They're going to go where they can. And when I was working stormwater down there, we had, what would happen is the homeless folks would have to, they'd actually do their business in the uh, doorways or the alcoves, and then the shop owners, first thing they do when they get up in the morning is hose all that out into the street, into the storm drain system. So it's a terrible situation. We need, we could do a much better job you know, helping our homeless, getting them the resources that they need so that they can have healthier populations. So I'm sure there's some human waste in there. Yes. Um, do you know if there is any local policy or incentives for both individual uh, or, uh, I guess, business, groups of businesses to implement a LID? Because basically I'm thinking about, let's say someone wants to put in a garden it might be more expensive to put in a rain garden. Maybe they could get a tax refund or some other incentive. Do you know if that's being implemented? Um, the question is, is there incentives to put rain gardens in? I don't specifically know. I know that West Basin in my neck of the woods, uh, for a while they were helping people and they would get a rebate for depending on your square footage, but then they kind of ran out of money. I'm looking for one now. <laughs> so if you hear one, let me know. Will you? Uh, as far as on the larger business scale, I, I'm not sure what the, I know that the regulations are there. I don't know what, if there's any tax breaks or anything like that. It would be great. That's what we need. Yes. The, you said that you wanted 12 more inches dredged at the, uh, the, the, the Playa de la Marsh. Is that what you're pushing for? 12 more inches? No, no, that, that was over in the Bayana wetlands. It's not 12 inches, it's 12 feet. Yeah. That's that whole area that sits to the north of Bayana Creek. That's where all the fill went from the dredging of Santa Monica, uh, the Marina del Rey. And it's up about, it's about 12 foot of fill there. And so to get that, to make it more of a, to get that into a functioning wetland, you've got to remove that sediment. And so the various alternatives, except for the no project alternative for that EIR, is virtually all those, all the alternatives have removing that sediment. Okay. 
Yes, sir. I do a lot of kayaking off of Redondo and Alameda's Harbor, and I have noticed after rains, and I don't know if you have any program about this, but a tremendous amount of runoff of plastics. Oh, it's yeah. just a phenomenal amount, much more than in years past, but it's just a phenomenal amount of plastic out there now. Bags floating out there, you know, I, I pick up, I end up with a whole kayak full of plastic, you know. Yeah, and especially that first storm of the season. Uh, this, or programs going on to catch that? Yes, there are. Uh, the question is, all the plastics after storms. Um, who's, who's been along the beach right after a major storm? Especially the first, what we call the first flush. I call it LA getting its first enema, okay? It's, <laughs> it's pretty gruesome out there, okay? Yeah, in fact, uh, earlier this winter, right after we had our first set of rains, I was doing the beach characterization study at South Torrance Beach. They call it Rat Beach. My students love going there because they want to see what Rat Beach looked like. You know, they want to see rats running around. No, 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 it's not like that. <laughs> but, but it must be, it's like, a, it's like the when the, after the storm fronts go through, if there's not another pressure system interfering, you'll get strong northwesterly winds. And that tends to blow everything right in there. And it was, it was amazing how much plastic was there. There is on, for the LA River, I believe, and Bionna Creek, there's a, I talked about this awful acronym, TMDL. That, TMDLs are where you take an individual pollutant and you have to come up with a program to reduce levels of that pollutant to when they're within the water quality objectives of your plan, like the ocean plan or your basin plans for inland waters. For trash, zero. And so they have a TMDL that the County of Los Angeles, under its stormwater permit, and all the adjacent and all the cities under that permit, which the big one is the city of LA, by a certain timeline they have to get it so that there's no trash going out by the creek. You know, it's like good luck with that. But they're working on a lot of ways to try to do that by netting trash, by cleaning more effective street cleaning by having more trash cans out there. There's a lot of things they could do starting with just public education. I think that's where the big one is. Public education and maybe reducing all the packaging that we have for plastics. You know, if you get something from a fast food place, you got a clamshell and a clamshell and all kinds of stuff going on. So from individuals all the way to big systems like a trash net on buying a creek, okay, to do that, but it's a long road to haul. That's a problem. We have time for one more question, and then we'll take it to the gift shop. Somebody's waving her hand That's back. That's Matt way out there. Okay. Are you optimistic that we might see salmon runs return to LA, San Gabriel, San Ana Rivers? <laughs> if we could get rid of those damn dams, <laughs> I'm thinking of the Ringe Dam in Malibu Creek. Uh, you've got the Matillaha Dam up in uh, Ventura. And I'm not too familiar with the San Gabriel watersheds and stuff like that, but if we can give the salmon some room, you know, like the steelheads. Steelheads are pretty durable fish. They'll go into places where you go, no self-respecting trout type thing would want to go there, but they do. So if we give them a chance, they'll go, okay? And I think the really big one, especially in the Malibu watershed, is somehow trying to notch down and, and deal with that, the Ringe Dam. The Army Corps has been working on that for years. And they got plans and things, it's just getting it done. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right.